Welcome once again to another episode of Strange Planet. Thanks for sticking me in your ear. And if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet, you might want to consider becoming a premium subscriber. All you need to do is click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. There are three monthly programs or tiers to choose from. You gain access to commercial free listening, bonus episodes, and a subscription to my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. All right, on this episode, the alien abduction phenomena and the motives of the aliens. What do they want? We're going to get into that with Karen Wilkinson. She's the author of a brand new book called Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest. Karen's a regular writer, contributor to our good friend Ellie Marzulli's monthly newsletter, Politics, Prophecy, and the Supernatural. She's a wife, mother, grandmother. She worked in the software industry for many years before leaving to raise her family. And for as long as she can remember, she's been abducted by non-human alien entities, possibly hundreds of times. She's seen many UAPs throughout her lifetime and suffered emotional and physical ailments and had surgeries due to the things that they did to her. Karen Wilkinson, welcome to Strange Planet. How are you? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. I'm very happy to be here. I'm thrilled to be on your show. Thank you. So this is the question that everybody wants to know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I've talked to probably close to, a, I'm guessing, ballparking at 100 uh, abductees um, through my radio and podcasting career. Some don't want to be called abductees. They claim, you know, they just say they're experiencers or contactees. Um, and they have differing views and on, on what they believe these beings want what do you think they want you know that's a really good question i think they want a lot of different things um i think they want to utilize the population the human and animal population for experimentation i think that they are utilizing the human population for a breeding program which i was a part of um beyond that I think, you know, I do not feel that they're benevolent, the ones that are abducting people. Um, I'll say that right off the bat, <laughs> um, because the things that happened to me and that have happened to my friends and the people I've talked to certainly are not kind uh, or loving or wonderful. It's not, it's not love and light. That's not what's happening here. And is there a, can you sort of project out into the future? Like, is there an ultimate goal that they have uh, for this experimentation and, and a hybrid program? What is the, what is the end game? You know, my take on the end game is that they are building an army of, of uh, followers of people, whether it's humans, whether it's hybrid beings, um, from a biblical perspective, I, you know, Satan's outnumbered two to one. And the late Dr. Chuck Missler used to say he's building an army. And that's what they're doing. And I 100% agree with him that they're working to create hybrid beings like they did in Genesis 6 in the Bible and working to perfect that so that they are, you know, hard to tell from a regular human. So this has been ongoing for you, um, what, for as long as you can remember? Yes, as long as I can remember. My earliest memories are of being abducted, being a scared little kid, going to bed at night, wondering, you know, where can I hide? Is there anywhere I can hide that they can't find me? But there was nowhere I could hide. They always found me. And just being terrified every night to go to bed. Are they coming tonight? You know, and we didn't know what they were. You know, back then, I mean, I'm not as young as, <laughs> as I was. But back then, we didn't have the words to describe them. We didn't know what they were. There was... No, there were no TV shows. There were no, you know, um, social media. We didn't have the internet that we have today. So we didn't have any reference for what was happening, those of us being taken back then. And it was terrifying. Was there a typical or is there a typical abduction scenario? Do you go through the window, through the ceiling? How does it happen? Absolutely. As a child, um, and at night, the first thing that would happen is you would feel, before they even showed up, you would just feel almost an evil presence. You'd feel just everything changed. Um, if they, we were in the country and the cicadas and the crickets were going, they would stop. It would get quiet. 
you could just feel evil into the room. And um, then generally, usually there would be a couple of the shorter gray aliens that would show up in the room and levitate you off the bed. And then you would go through a closed window or through the ceiling, I would. And for me, when you get close to the ceiling or the um, window, you feel this vibration in your body just picking up and it feels like you're in a just a million bazillion little pieces, right? And almost like your body's made out of ball bearings or something. And you're thinking, how am I going through this window? Or how am I going through the ceiling? And I can see every little detail of the ceiling or details of the screen on the other side of the window or wherever I happen to be going through at the time. <laughs> And, you know, as a small child, you don't, you can't get up to the ceiling to see things like the little curls in, there was a wallpaper on that ceiling and you could see how it was a little bit um, browned and it was a little bit curled, or I could see the bugs in the light fixture, you know, it, things that you can't see from the floor. And then things in the house would just get further and further away. And at that point, generally they would kind of black you out, turn you off as the normal as people say, um, and you, the rest of it, you wouldn't remember, but often I was awake for the whole thing and remembered what they were doing. Um, can you, can you tell me what they were doing? Um, you know, as much as you can comfortably relate to me? Yes, absolutely. It was different. You know, every time would be different. And during different times of my life, it was different. When I was little, they did a lot of, you know, looking at me, checking my body out, my spine, taking blood or skin samples or things. I didn't know what they were. It looked like x-ray machines or needles. I still to this day have an issue with procedures I have done that <laughs> require big needles because as a small child, that was just very horrifying, you know, to go through those things. Um, so all kinds of just experiments or, you know, uh, keeping watching me, figuring out, you know, my genetics, things like that. I guess genetics, I wouldn't know that at that age, but, you know, taking blood samples and things like that. So they did a lot of experiments on me as a young child. And sometimes I would just be walking around or sitting with other children playing you know, some of the children were very messed up, didn't look human and weren't right, like kind of kind of hitting the sides of their heads or being very quiet or crying or, or what have you. And um, how much of, uh, of what was going on were your parents aware of? None of it, because I was warned to, you know, for, for two, one, first, we didn't have, we didn't know how to say who they were. I called them the little ones that came to get us. Um, or the ones that came to get us, depending. Um, and we were threatened and warned not to talk about it. They showed me screen memories of my family members being beheaded or being hurt or being killed. And when you're five or six years old, that is that is just beyond what your little psyche can handle, you know? And so you're quiet and you're compliant. And I learned to just be quiet, be compliant and accept what was happening to me because I didn't want to hurt my family or my friends. I was terrified. How did you function though? After the, after an abduction experience, how do you just get up and go to school and, and whatever? How do you function at that age? Barely is the answer, barely. Um, I was withdrawn at times. I was, they found me when I was five or six years old, huddled in the corner of a bathroom stall, just rocking, you know, I just lost it. I, you know, and then eventually your brain kind of takes over and compartmentalizes to the point that you just, you put it somewhere else. The same as anyone else who goes through a tragic situation, you know, when it's just so hard to handle you, you're find a way you're brain, your body finds a way. And I just completely separated it from my life. And just, if I could pretend it wasn't happening, then I could pretend I was a normal kid. So it was pretending I'm normal, which I wasn't, but I tried. When did you first start to share or confide in someone that this was happening to you? 
I didn't, not until recently, not until the last couple of years. I had had a, a near death experience that I like to call a near life experience. And I write about that in the book and it was an amazing experience, but it came with a lot of PTSD. And so I went through therapy for that PTSD and what it actually did was help me deal with this and the lifetime of abductions. And I learned to be able to just deal with it and be able to think about it and realized I need to get this off. I need to get this off my chest. I need to get this out there. I need to, I don't know what I need to do with this, but I need to do something. And I had renewed my Christianity at that point in my faith and I felt led to LA, Marzulli. And so I, we ended up in the same place at the same time. And I told him my story. He listened. I never thought anyone would listen. You know, it was the most freeing thing I have ever done and the most terrifying at the same time. I'm like, here I am telling the story I have bottled up my whole life. I was afraid to tell my husband. You, I tried to tell people once or twice. They just blew it off and laughed and thought I was, you're drunk or you're drinking or you're crazy or what are you talking about? Ha ha. And move along. And then I learned, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, but LA listened and he understood what I was talking about. And he told me I wasn't alone. And my whole life, I couldn't even look at UFO movies or books or podcasts or YouTubes or anything because it was too triggering and too terrifying. Like the when Whitley Straver's book came out, I saw the cover of that book. I just about had a heart attack. I probably peed my pants a little. I'm just saying it was bad. Um and I, you know, I realized I have a problem. I got to figure out how to deal with this. And, um, you know, God really helped me deal with that. Um, and so after I talked to LA, <laughs> that first kind of year and a half of that, that first year was really scary, scary, difficult, knowing that I had shared that I kept waiting for someone, something to happen, you know. Um, and then I started writing it. I felt led, the Holy Spirit led to write about it. And every day I would wake up in the morning and I would hear this, you know, the Holy Spirit leading me in my head, write. And every afternoon and every evening, write, write, write. And I'm like, what do I write, God? And God's like, write the truth. That's easy. You know what to write. Just write your story. And he was right. I wrote this book in like less than three months because I just sat down and I just wrote what happened to him. And that was, you know, hard, <laughs> emotionally difficult. Just ask my husband. He went through those ups and downs with me, but it was also, also extremely cathartic. It helped me just continue to deal with it and to be able to talk about it. And I can talk about it in interviews and I'll be fine. After this, I'll go and cry, <laughs> pray, and deal with, you know, because every time I talk about it, it's, it's hard and it's emotional. You mentioned a near life experience. Can you explain what that was? Sure, absolutely. I was going in for one of the many surgeries I've had. I have all this crazy, unusual bone growth and things that happen that they just can't explain. And uh, but prior to surgery, I was in the operating room with a couple of IV ports in, but I was not hooked up to anything yet, not hooked up to IVs. Um, and the um, um, the uh, <laughs> The woman came in to give me the sedative, the um, and um, she had a pocket full of syringes, which was really weird. And I only saw her, I saw her before that. She came into the pre-op room, and then she came into the surgery room, and she put the needle into my IV port, pushed what was supposed to be a sedative, and turned around and walked out of the room. Didn't say, hey, "Are you? How's it feel? Are you okay?" Nothing. She gave me a paralytic. And I died on the table with no one around me. And uh, it was terrifying. And it was like drowning, but not being in water. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I couldn't sing up for help. Um, and uh, it was, that's where the PTSD therapy came in because that was just, because I still had to have surgeries after that, you know? And I was like, I can't keep, I can't go back in there. Who was um, she? Do you know? She was supposed to have been the, um, no, I don't know. I don't even know her name. Was it an accident or what, did she try and kill you? 
I always have assumed it was an accident. And I prayed for her that if it was hard on her knowing that she did that to me, that, that, that didn't stay with her, you know, that she could get over that too. Um, she was an anesthesiologist, uh, but I never saw her again. And when I died, I, when I was on the table and I was dying, a voice in my head, as clear as me talking to you said, it's okay. You can let go now. And just in the flash in the blink of an eye, I was out of my body. I could still see and hear everything, but it was not my physical body. And I was still me, which was the craziest part of it that without my physical body my personality was still with me it was just so well and I could see in all the other rooms around it so I could see the doctor in the other room getting the stuff ready for the surgery and I saw the nurse realize that I was not breathing and run into that room and I saw him come running out yelling bag her bag her and you know they put a, a bag thing over my face and and they um eventually intubated me and got me breathing again on the machines. And um, that's when I didn't, that's when I, it goes black that I don't see anymore. Um, and they continued with the surgery, which they probably should have. You know, I don't, I don't know. I have no way of knowing if that was done on purpose or not. Um, who knows? <laughs> you know, I know that I'm not popular for sharing this kind of information. I'll tell you that. Um, but, um, I'm determined to do it because I really, I want it to be okay to talk about these things. I want to remove some of that stigma of you've been abducted. You've had these experiences. So many women I've talked to have had the exact same experiences I have. And, you know, there's comfort in that, even though what happened was terrible and they need to be able to talk about it honestly and there's just no one for them to talk to and there's nowhere for them to go and it's not okay to talk about it I mean what do you do go to your doctor and say hey this happened to me they're gonna call you crazy put you on a 72 hour hold you know whatever I mean so I want to be able to make it okay to talk about it and I want to talk about what's happening and that's why I wrote this book because I just can't find anyone who's talking about what's who's written about what's really happening to us especially the women that are being abducted and the men We'll take a time out, Karen, back with more of our conversation, Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest, right here on Strange Planet. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel, all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Karen Wilkinson is the author of Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest, regular writer, contributor to L.A. Marzulli's monthly newsletter, Politics, Prophecy, and Supernatural, and a, a lifelong alien abductee. Um, we've just been kind of talking around it about what happened to you. You were raped by these beings, you write. Okay. I was, yes, I was. And that was really hard to write about and it's even harder to talk about. Um, so some of that, you have to excuse me if I can't talk about that as much, but um, it's very triggering for me and it's very hard as a victim of that. But um, the hardest part of it was that it was, I was pregnant and I didn't know that it was from them. You know, I, I was married at the time and, and um and uh, about three months along, I started to 
feel bad. I had, you know, my stomach hurt really bad, but I hadn't passed anything. I hadn't passed a baby or anything. And, um, excuse me. And, um, I went into the hospital and, uh, there was no heartbeat and they did an ultrasound and there was no baby and they did a DNC and there was no fetal tissue. And that doctor said to me, ma'am, are you sure you were pregnant? <laughs> I'd been to the doctor, you know, we'd done all the things we'd heard the heartbeat, we'd, you know, all those things. So, and I didn't get to know if that was a boy or a girl. I didn't get to have a memorial service for that baby because it wasn't there. It was just gone. And that kept happening to me until I realized what was happening that, you know, they were taking these babies back from me and they weren't mine anyway. They were, you know, obviously something that they were utilizing me to create. And I realized they're taking them when they are, because your body knows when there's something wrong with a baby or a fetus and it will naturally reject that baby and you'll have a miscarriage. And I think at about that point is when the human body would realize this is not a human fetus and would reject it. And I think that's why they take them when they do. Do you believe, I mean, do you think you've ever seen one of your children uh, on yes. board one of these craft? Oh, on board the craft? No, no. Um, I don't have any memory of seeing them on the craft. I'm trying to, you know, and I still have some memories that I just haven't quite <laughs> dealt with yet. But I have seen, they did show up um, one night in my room. And I write about this in the book too. And I knew they were my children. They looked enough like my children to be my children. But they were not, they were not okay. There was definitely something, just such an air of evil about them. Um, they weren't, they didn't want to, they didn't come to say, hey, we're your kids and we love you. You know, they came to try to lure me back, to get me back there. And they were, they were evil. They were just, you just could feel the evil emanating off of them. It was a horrifying, horrifying incident. And, um, and at first, you know, before that, I thought, I really want to, I really want to see these kids. If they are alive, I want to see them because they're half me. So maybe I can fix them. Maybe I can help them. Maybe they'll be okay. And I think, I th really do think God allowed me to see them, allowed them to come into my, my space so that. I could see that they weren't, there was nothing I could do, but there was no way I could help them. Did they communicate with you? Um, they, it was like a telepathic communication you know, in my head. They just come with us, come with us, come with us. That's all they said. And um, I said, no, no, in Jesus name, no, I'm not coming with you. And, and it, I had to resist and it was hard because a part of me wanted to go with them. But the other part of me knew that, and I could feel it. I just didn't feel anything good or anything kind. I didn't see anything. Their eyes were black, you know, just vacuous. Just there was nothing there. There was nothing there for me and nothing for me to save. Did they look human enough where they could, I don't know, fit in? No, no, no. they were too short, too stocky, too, their eyes were just too dark. And then the room was really dark and around them, it was really dark. You know, that was like, like there was a dark darkness around them darker than the rest of the room and um it was hard to see the, all the details of them but i could see that they looked they had features like my children and then initially i thought it was one of my kids coming to wake me up but my kids are taller and older and um so i realized it wasn't them right away and uh but they still had features that looked like it but no they couldn't have passed for for you or me or someone in public is it part of their their agenda to I don't know refine this this as part of this hybrid uh, human ET hybrid program? Are they mm -hmm. trying? Do you think to make them more human so that they could fit in and walk among us? I absolutely think that that is the goal. Um, yeah, I when you say walk among us, it makes me think of a Dr. David Jacobs book, Walking Among Us. I picked up that book. I tried to read it. I got about two pages in and I couldn't. It was just too triggering. Um, so I'd like to read it, but I just still haven't been able to. Um, but I absolutely believe that that's what they're doing. It goes back to, you know, Dr. Chuck Whistler saying they're 
you know, trying to build an army that outnumbered. And this is, this is one of the ways to do it. And it's one of the ways to deceive people too, because, you know, if you can't tell the difference, then, you know, you're not going to know. And if they're there to deceive and to lie and to, you know, then that I think is the ultimate goal. What is ectogenesis? Oh, ectogenesis is something that we're doing today and and it's what I believe they do, what I've seen them doing on um, when I've been either in the ships or underground. Um, it's the ability to bring a fetus to completion outside of a natural womb. So um, it's, uh, went, oh wait, am I, I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I'm I'm going outside of it. Ecto, yeah, ectogenesis is not that. I'm sorry, I'm I'm just so right now thinking about those kids, and my brain has just gone off into left field. Now, ectogenesis is the um, is when um, people believe we've been seeded outside of um, from another species outside of our universe, outside of our world. So, um, sort of the ancient alien theory of 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 uh, beings coming in. You know, our elder space brethren coming in and seeding us, which I do not believe at all is the truth. So the, um, you go back to, uh, to Genesis and you, you, do you believe these are like fallen angels? I do. I absolutely do. I do. And I have some very strong feelings about the gray uh, alien entities as well that most people see. And I've written a lot about that in the book and for LA's newsletter. Um, but yeah, I do absolutely believe they are fallen angelic beings. You know, you had the the uh, original ones that fell in Genesis 6. And then, you know, as we believe, it says they continued on after that. And, um, and I do believe this is what's still going on today. Uh, another time out and uh, back with more of my conversation with Karen Wilkinson. Don't go away. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Lifelong alien abductee, Karen Wilkinson, the author of Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest. I guess we shouldn't refer to them ET as ETs. What do you call them? Uh, well, fallen angels, would they be classified as interdimensionals? It's hard to say. Yeah, you know, we're, we were born for and designed for the earth the way that it is now. But these entities, you know, God created them before us. That is, you can find out about that more in the Bible and all kinds of extra biblical texts and ancient texts and scrolls and things. Um, and these entities were created before us for a different, a different type of um, world. And so they're not adhering to the laws of physics that we're adhering to. They're not, they're not made for earth the way we are. So whether it's another dimension or another heavenly realm or what have you, they are definitely made for a different place than where we are. And there were, you know, angelic beings that chose to fall and chose to fall away from God. So you have good angelic beings, which I've had um, instances with where I've had wonderful things where I've had angelic beings show up and help me. And, and after my near death experience, and then, you know, you have these, these fallen who are 
a hundred percent evil. There is nothing about them I can say that is benevolent at all. Why? Why? And I've I've spoken to many many abductees who well they don't again they don't like that word they think these are our space brothers and uh, you know they're they talk how loving these entities are and their show films about you know how we're destroying our planet and they're here to help us and so forth how do we reconcile these two i mean is it a different are they having encounters with the good angels or are they is this part of i don't know stockholm syndrome what's going on here yeah i completely understand that because i was a part of that too for a while you know there's stockholm syndrome going on definitely um, I was shown the movies of the earth flooding and things like that. I was told that they were here to help. Um, and I was buying into that, but you can only buy into that so far because if they are these loving, benevolent helpers who have come to help us, why are they abducting little children? Why are they raping women? Why are they taking fetuses from someone's womb? Why are they draining the blood from the cattle? Why, if you want to get your message across and you're so intelligent and so benevolent and so far advanced, can't you find a better way than terrorizing children? I mean, honestly, if you're looking to just find out more about our race and you're so intelligent, can't you find a better way to do it? But the horror that I've been through, and I've listened to and read about and listened to people who've said how they feel they are benevolent and they are space brothers. But, you know, not one of those people has been able to tell me, has been able to explain the terrible things that have happened to them. You know, they still have the bad stuff that's happened. Why? Why children? Why do they start so young? I, you know, I really think it's grooming. You start with a young child. And for me, it just became normal. It became part of my life. I learned how to deal with it. I learned how to live with it. I learned how to parrot the story they were telling me. I believed them. I thought, you know, I had this person with me from the time I was little. I call him my handler. Um, And other women I've talked to have had a person that was always with them as well. So I believe for some of us, we had handlers who were there helping to groom us, to teach us how to... Um, parrot their story out to people, how to act, react, how to not be afraid, how to deal with it. They would tell us what was going to happen. It's okay. We're just doing this because blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry. Rape is still rape. I'm sorry. Kidnapping is still kidnapping. You can't tell me you can go and kidnap your neighbor's child and say, well, I had a really good reason. I wanted to do some research. That's not going to fly. And it doesn't fly with them either. So I believe the children are groomed to be utilized later in life. You know, if they can't interact with us, and this goes back to a lot of things that Vicki Joy Anderson talks about, where you need a lot of permissions to be able to come into someone's life and someone's space. Then if you've got a human proxy who's willing to do that for you, wow, that's great, right? But it's going to take a lot of programming to get someone to that point. And there are a lot of people who do believe that. And that hurts my heart for them. You were taught to pilot a UFO. Talk to me about that. Yeah. The, you know, when I was on board with the program and I was all gung-ho with everything that they were selling um, and the lies that they were telling, um, I was given an opportunity to fly one of these things. And you're never alone. There's always another one with you. And and I don't want to talk about it to the point that it makes it sound like it's this great, fun thing. And I don't want anyone to think that these encounters were fun and fantastical just because they would pepper in a couple of fun and unique experiences to try to kind of make the other stuff easier to deal with, which is why I think they let me do that. You know, do I think I was ever in complete control? Probably not because there was always another one there, but I did get to have that experience of sitting in the seat, feeling it just form around me. And you, if you do it through your, thoughts and through just the slightest body movements and I write about how that worked because you know I've I've since heard other people talk about a similar experience so um but I don't I don't want to glamorize it at all 
as, as to why they allowed you to do that, is that, would it be somewhat similar to, let's say, an abuser buying you a new dress once in a while? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's absolutely what I was, yeah, trying to, what I would say is that, you know, if they give you a positive experience once in a while, then they think that's going to help make up for some of the bad experiences well, as an abuser would. And that's the same kind of thing. And it's also, you know, you wonder, well, why, why aren't people talking about this more? Why doesn't someone, why didn't I say something? Why didn't I do something? Well, again, it's, it is like being in an abusive relationship. Um, you make excuses. Well, you know, they really do care about us. Well, they really do love us. Well, they really are trying to help us because that's what they say, but it's not what they do. I mean, I haven't seen any positive things come from them. We hear about nuclear missiles being shut down. But do we know if those were good angelic beings or if they were the ones that are um, abducting people? We don't. They didn't come down and say, hey, we're the good guys and we just want you to know we're doing this. And honestly, I could see either side doing that because if you blow up this world, they lose their playground. And they lose and they lose their time because their time is kind of dependent on our time, biblically speaking. So all of that is intertwined. Uh, it's been long believed that uh, the abduction phenomena is generational. Do you believe that? And is it possible your do you think your parents or your mother was also an abductee? Um, I do believe it's generational and I can't speak for the members of my family who are still alive, so I won't do that. But I will say, yes, there has been some generational abduction. And I believe it's done because once you find, I believe once they find a genetic materials that work for them or breeding stock that works for them, they want to continue working with that. And it seems that their lifespans are much longer than ours. And if they are fallen angelic beings, as I believe them to be, and as I feel that I know them to be, then they definitely have a much longer lifespan. I can tell you that the handler who was with me um and that's just a nice word for it because i don't want to say what i really think um he never seemed to age and i aged quite a bit um did this eventually stop or are you still experiencing abductions no it stopped it stopped when i renewed my commitment to god and my faith and my christianity and it stopped when i realized that um, it's not just about saying, well, I'm a Christian and I'm praying or I'm doing this or I'm doing that. So they have to leave me alone. It's about understanding the authority in the name of Jesus. It's understanding that there is authority in that. And when you speak it with that authority that you've been given through, through you from God, then, then it works. And then they can't touch you anymore. And not that they haven't tried because they have come back and they have tried. And I have, had crazy things happen since I've done this, but they can't, they can't hurt me and they can't take me and they can't touch me. They can get this close, but they can't, you know, they get right up in my face, but they can't, they can't hurt me anymore. Uh, would you recite the Jesus prayer or how do you stop them? I just call in the name of Jesus. And I say in the name of Jesus, you cannot touch me and you cannot hurt me and you cannot have me. And I tell them to leave in the name of Jesus and rebuke them in the name of Jesus. LA likes to say rebuke first, ask questions later. 100% agree. You see something, you see a ship, you see something, rebuke first, ask questions later. And you see them, they come into your room and they what, they turn on their heels and they leave? Right now, they they don't come in anymore, but they'll come to the window. Um, yeah, so they haven't, they can't come back in, they can't cross my threshold anymore. They've tried, they can't come across the threshold. So that is one thing I like to thank you, Vicki Joy Anderson, for all the wonderful things that she's written, because that really helped me as well. Um, I met her right after I met LA, or I found in her book through LA, and we became friends, and she's got just amazing amazing helpful stuff in her book it's just right the, the idea of the threshold covenant yes absolutely so She's, it's like the modern vampire narrative that they can't come in unless you invite them yes and you know yeah they're all working in the same rules under the same rule book they're all no matter what they are what type of being you think you know that they are they're all operating in the same 
under the same rules and under the same restrictions. Um, you mentioned um, you mentioned Roswell in '47, of course, which we're mm -hmm. so familiar with, and also right. the Grenada Treaty of 1954. Mm -hmm. uh, what are those two? Well, first of all, what is the Grenada Treaty of '54, and what does it and Roswell have to do with alien abductions? Right. Um, I bring those up because for a lot of people, the first time they heard about anything like this, the first thing they hear about is Roswell. And I bring that up because it's one that for many years was, everyone said, oh, it's a hoax. It's not true. And now we know and the government has come forward and said, yes, these things, you know, things did happen. Well, they have not given us details. At least they've admitted that something happened. Um, I bring up the Grenada Treaty because I think it's important because it shows a there's a lot of information about it out there. A lot of it's been redacted, but it shows that at some point, someone, whether it was a government group or an offshoot of a government group or a private group, we don't know. Someone made an agreement that um, with these entities, with these alien entities, that they could take people or animals for experimentation in exchange for technology or what have you. And look at what's happened with our technology. I mean, you don't go from the Gutenberg printing press to this, you know, we're the same people with the same brains and the same knowledge yet, you know, that we were a thousand years ago, but look what's happened in the last 100, 200 years. That's crazy that we had help. You can't say we didn't. It doesn't make sense any other way. It wasn't this nice, slow, even progression of people learning. It was boom, there it is. And it all goes back to the same, you know, people in the same time frames and, and the same things. And some of it goes back to that as well. If um, someone was, if someone listening is experiencing what you experienced, abductions, what advice would you give them? My advice would be to seek out your Bible, seek out, um, your faith and just pray, pray that God will show you or that for a path to safety from this, because you don't have to put up with this anymore. No one has to put up with this. No one has to be taken. Anyone can stop this. Anyone can stop this. And it's not about what, whether you're in church every Sunday, and it's not about whether you know the Bible, and it's not about whether you know the priest or the preacher or this or that or the other thing. It's nothing to do with that. It has to do with that you're a human and that the authority of Jesus means they have to stop taking you if you claim that. So you have opportunities. And there are groups out there, there are support groups. There are, you know, you can go to my website and send me a message, and I will do my absolute best to get back to you if you do that you can go to la marzulli's website you can go to vicky joy anderson's website there are a lot of people there are people like you who really do care and really want to help and uh, the links are in the episode notes stolen seed evil harvest.com karen wilkinson author.com karen is spelt with an i k a r i n la marzulli.net but all the links are in the episode notes Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest, how do we get a copy? Right now, you can go to lamarzuli.net, L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I.net. Again, it'll be in the show notes. You can go there right now. It's still on a pre-sale price, so get it now because it's a, um, it's on sale. And um, they are shipping now. The book is out. Um, and you can link to that through my website as well. Um, Karen Wilkinson author.com. You can find me on Facebook and you can find links through there as well. Um, and right now it's exclusively at lamarzuli.net. Karen, great to meet you. Thank you so much for sharing this story. I appreciate it. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate your time, taking the time to listen. And like I said, if anyone out there, if this is happening to you, just reach out, just know you're not alone and you don't have to put up with this. If it's if it's terrorizing you or torturing you, we can help you stop it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, 
unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Hey there, and welcome to another episode of Strange Planet. Thanks, as always, for sticking me in your ear. And if you'd like to get a little deeper into Strange Planet, you might want to consider becoming a premium subscriber. Just click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. You gain access to commercial-free listening, bonus episodes, a subscription to my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, and more. Strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. All right, we are going to uh, meet a, uh, a remote viewer. She can teach you or, uh, or help you develop your remote viewing skills. She is also a noted UFO researcher, author, podcaster, and it's a great pleasure to welcome to the program, Marjorie Kay. Margie, Margie Kay, how are you? I'm great. Thank you, Richard. You're down in Kansas City. I am down in Kansas City I, on the Missouri side, not the Kansas side. Ah, I've been to Kansas City, Kansas and Kansas City, uh, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did not know until recently that Kansas City is kind of a UFO hotspot. Um, tell me about, uh, yeah. about that. What, I mean, Missouri shows up like top 10 list of UFO hotspots in America, but Kansas City in particular. Yeah, we seem to be the hot spot in the state, uh, depending on the year, but uh, we're consistently having what we call flaps, where you have a large number of sightings in a short period of time. And uh, we've had one in 2011 that was huge. Uh, we had more UFO sightings during October of 2011 than any other place in the world. Um, then we had another one in uh, 2012. 2013, 2019, we had a uh, mass sighting, which was all over the city with thousands of reports going into the local media. And uh, it was decided that these three, you know, floating, whatever they were, on balloons or whatever, were something from DARPA. However, that didn't gel out. But uh, the media took that and said, oh, it's it solved and, you know, it's over with. But uh, we're still investigating that one. Uh, and and uh, tell me about Lake. Is it Giacomo or Giacomo? Giacomo. Yeah. What's going on yeah. there? Well, uh, that seems to be a hot spot for UFOs, uh, as well as Blue Springs Lake, which is actually connected to it. Uh, people see them going in and out of the lakes quite often. And uh, there's one particular researcher. Uh, his name is Wayne Lawrence. He co-authored the book Fast Movers with me. He uh, began to see objects with the naked eye, and so he started filming them and then slowing the film down. And when you slow the film down quite a bit and look at it, uh, you know, frame by frame, there are many objects going in and out of that lake. It's it's just crazy. We think the only explanation possibly could be that there is a base under there, mm -hmm. but these objects move so fast, up to eight thousand miles an hour or or more. That you can't see them with the naked eye normally. Um, I do simply because I use my six sensibilities and I can see them if I want to. But um, to most, for most people, they don't see them unless they're filmed, and then you go back and look at the film later. 
Is it a deep lake? It's about 45 feet deep at the deepest point. But uh, the odd thing about it is we've taken a look at it from Google Earth, and there are these perfectly square or rectangular structures that just don't fit anything natural. So, uh, I, you know, it could even go deeper than that. But according to, you know, our our information that we've got publicly, it's 45 feet. Um, I was reading a, an article in the uh, well, one of the Kansas City newspapers about the UFO flaps, and um, you were uh, quoted in the piece. Uh, I get the sense you're kind of frustrated with the media down there. <laughs> well, they do what they can, but, you know, actually, it's frustrating to them, too, because I've gotten to know a lot of these people, and they eventually come to the point where they say, look, we can't cover the story anymore. We have orders coming from above or somebody came to visit the general manager and said no more and who that somebody is i don't know but we can only guess that uh they only go to a certain point and then they don't dig any deeper so that part of it is frustrating but you know we leave it to the investigators let us dig it out and figure it out but i really don't think that the general public is ever going to see anything in the paper that says this issue is solved it was you a, a bona fide UFO or an ET, uh, and, and none of that changed. the the uh, The attitude towards coverage changed after, let's say, December twenty seventeen, with that landmark piece in the New York Times about ATIP or the you know the subsequent um, hearings in Congress, which were pretty historic. Well, it has changed quite a bit, but uh, if you think about it, what has been released to the public by the government is still minimal they've they're they've been just doing this gradual rollout of disclosure where they're saying oh yes that is something we don't know about and and you know every few months they'll come up with something new uh, but it's a very very slow disclosure process that i think is going to be ongoing and eventually we may get to the point where they say well yeah we've recovered something that's actually extraterrestrial uh so you know i expect that to happen within the next couple of years yeah you're right i mean it's it seems to be uh, two steps forward one step back two steps sideways although yeah let me get your thought on this um uh arrow uh the um anomalous uh resolution office uh, anomalous uh aerial yeah arrow. resolution office right that's it right where and and they've interviewed um uh, people like Robert Salas, I believe, and Robert Hastings, and talked about UFOs uh, and incursions over nuclear sites back in the 60s, like Malmstrom uh, back in 66 or 67. Uh, pretty interesting work happening with Aero, don't you think? Yes, I do. Uh, I And I, I have more faith in that project than some others. Um, I think that this is something that had to happen. The People, you know, had to make this a little bit more public and come out with what they know, um, because for for years and years, investigators have known about these things, but the general public hasn't, largely because of the the media cover up and the government cover up. Uh, because when you're being basically threatened, uh, when a couple of gentlemen come in wearing black suits. And uh, and occasionally they look very strange and they tell you to stop doing what you're doing. Uh, you're probably going to do it. Uh, but but now the climate has changed, but it has not changed completely. As investigators, we are still seeing uh, government vehicles following us on investigations and our phones are tapped and our Comcast Internet is tapped. Um cell phones, things like that. So they're still interested and in, and in, and following us. And so, you know, quite frankly, there are some things that I've come to know about certain cases that I don't talk about to the public, uh, simply because what they do is on a certain case, if they show up, that's kind of an unspoken warning, in my opinion. So and have, so you, you yeah. personally have received an unspoken warning? Oh, many times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, many times. I ha I just have this knack for people wanting to contact me about their extremely bizarre 
cases, which a lot of times involve close encounters, abductions, ETs in their home or in their backyard. And uh, yeah, it just gets, it just, it sounds crazy, but, uh, but people seek me out because they know that I'll listen to them and um, I will listen to their story. And I'm not, I'm not going to make fun of them at all because there's just too much of this going on. Margie Kay is with us, the author of a number of books, including the Kansas City UFO Flaps, which we were just discussing, Haunted Independence, uh, Missouri, the Remote Viewing Workbook, a Sonoma County Phenomenon. We're going to uh, uh, delve into some of these in a moment, but let's let's talk about uh, your work uh, as a remote viewer. And I, I know you teach uh, a, a, an online workshop and you've got the, uh, the Remote Viewing Workbook. Um, now, I've I've dabbled in remote viewing. I'm a complete novice and I, I chalk um, some of my initial success up to maybe beginner's luck. Um, but I've had, I've done, you know, sort of remote viewing experiments when I was guest hosting on, on coast to coast and was able to identify certain objects and so forth. And I just, my method is again, untrained and I just kind of sketch and I have impressions that come to me. What, what, um, what methodology do you teach or utilize, or it is a kind of a combination of, of different methods? Well, I actually came across it accidentally and taught myself how to do it when I was working on a missing persons case. And this was in the 90s, early 90s. Uh, I did psychic readings for people. I've always been psychic since I was very, very young. And um, this I came about this in a very strange way. This group of ladies used to come visit me were uh, attorneys and uh, their legal assistants. And one day, so I knew them very well. One day, one of them called me and said that her niece had, had was missing and didn't come home from the bus stop. And it had been about four hours uh, prior. She wanted to know if I could help find her. And so I thought, how am I going to find this girl? Because I'd never done anything like that before. I'd only just scanned people and, you know, read them personally. And all of a sudden this line came out of my solar plexus and I followed it. And I ended up standing on a street corner and I saw these two street signs. And I, so I asked the lady, I'm on the phone with her as, you know, does this make any sense to you? She goes, that is her bus stop. I said, okay. Um, so then the line went across the street. I followed it, went in a couple houses down and I see this golden glow around a house. So I knew I was in the right spot. And all of a sudden I'm rising up off the ground. And, and by the way, I could feel the ground. I could see everything just like, a, like it was, I was actually standing there. Okay. Feel the breeze, everything. And what I, I figured out later, what I was doing was using my etheric body to travel. And that's how, why it came out of my solar plexus. But anyway, um, all of a sudden I'm floating up above. I go into the back yard and there's a shed. And I just float down and all of a sudden there's no roof anymore. And I can see down inside the shed. And here's a girl, 14 years old. She's tied up. She's got duct tape on her mouth and she's asleep obviously drugged so i'm telling this gal on the phone what i'm seeing and i gave her the address i could see very clearly the address and what the house looked like so i thought well i'm going to look inside the house and see who's in there so i did that and i'm looking down and i see a woman with long blonde stringy hair in her 30s sitting on the couch and she says that's the woman who made friends with this girl and everybody thought it was very strange for a 30 year old woman to make friends with a 14 year old girl over a period of months and then there were also two men there and they were drinking beer and they had drug paraphernalia out and they were talking about how they were going to make ten thousand dollars by selling this girl in the morning so I told her that and I said, you need to go now. And evidently they had already been to the house with the police, but they only spoke to the woman at the door and they did not go in their house. So the woman went back. She called the detective that was working the case and he went with her, even though he didn't want her to go. They found the girl in the back, were able to rescue her and then arrest the three people. So that was my first introduction to remote viewing. 
Wow, that's quite an introduction. My word. Yeah. And uh, I just basically learned it myself. But if you want to hear an even stranger story, my remote viewing abilities were enhanced in 1985 by an extraterrestrial by the name of Valiant Thor. Ah, well, we know that name, don't we, Valiant Thor? Yeah. Well, he appeared to me. I didn't know who he was. He appeared to me as a head on the wall. He said, now you have x-ray vision after he did a light experiment with me with the red light and the green light. What that did was activated something in my brain. And so he said, now you have x-ray vision. And then he was gone. And I, I was left to figure out what that was. But I would find out later while I was re remote viewing people, I could see inside their body, see their skeleton, see their organs, everything, and point out where things, you know, there might be a problem or look for something, or if something was missing, I would see that it was missing. And uh, I've seen all kinds of weird things. I've seen organs in places where they're not supposed to be. I've seen um, hearts that are halfway not working. Um, and it's extremely accurate. I am extremely accurate with this. I would say, I, I don't want to say 100%, but at least 98%. Um, and that is, that is, because I, that ability was enhanced by Valiant Thor. Now, why he picked me to do that, he told me later on that he chooses certain people to work with who have certain abilities, and then he enhances them. And the whole purpose of that is to help raise consciousness of the planet. So what I do is because of that, training other people how to remote view is one of them. And... Um, you know, and various other things as well. But also uh, I do the radio network. I do my podcast. I do a magazine and write books all because of Valiant Thor. Because of, that's my mission here. Amazing. Well, he just came up in conversation yesterday when I was, uh, I was speaking with uh, Laura Eisenhower. Uh, and of course, Valiant Thor reportedly spent some time um, at the Pentagon in, uh, and at the White House, I guess, with, uh, with President Eisenhower, Laura's great-grandfather. He did. Uh, are you yes. in communication with Valiant Thor now? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, it's been a constant, and he's, he's in touch with me when he wants me to do something or if I need help, I will contact him. I know he saved my life at least three times. He's stepped in and uh, cured me instantly of life-threatening issues. So, uh, yeah, he's real. He is absolutely real. The film, uh, Stranger at the Pentagon, mm -hmm. it's a short film by Craig Campobasso. He's yeah. also a good friend of mine. And uh, that would give people kind of an idea what it is. And then also the book, Stranger at the Pentagon by Dr. Frank Stranges. Yes, yes. Craig's been on the show a couple of times. Oh, good. Told that story. Yeah, it's remarkable. Yeah. Uh, so... Can you give us, I think you, you point out in the, in, uh, in the book that if you're a psychic, if you have psychic abilities, it's, you can remote view maybe a little easier than people who don't have psychic abilities. I don't think I have, I don't think I have, I'm very intuitive at all. Um, but. Well, you have to be, if you were doing any type of remote viewing, uh, the thing is anybody can learn it because we all have the same physiology. We all have a pineal gland, which is the center of everything. And if that is not calcified by fluoride, mm -hmm. mainly from fluoride, if that's not calcified, and if you activate your psychic center and use it, then these things come much easier. But again, anybody can learn how to do it. Can you offer maybe a couple of, of, of tips from the, from the workbook? Sure. I, you know, the number one thing that I, that I tell everybody is meditation is the key to everything because what you have to do is put your state self in a state of altered consciousness. And that is slowing things down, being very quiet, not having any distractions and just going within and being very calm. If you do that for 10 minutes a day, that will make all the difference in the world. And then the other thing is to practice using your psychic center. You can do that in a number of ways. Dowsing is a good way to do it, um, either with a pendulum or dowsing rods. You could also uh, 
read cards or do energy work, anything like that is going to just activate that psychic center. And you'd be surprised after just a little bit of practice for a couple of weeks, what you're going to be able to do at, at that point and how much better you're going to be able to see. Because remote viewing, it's kind of a misnomer because you could remote view something that's right in front of you or something on Mars. And uh, when you're using the psychic center or you know telepathy, you're sending this energy out, <clears throat> this part of yourself that I believe is the etheric body. Some people say it's astral travel, but astral travel is, is more difficult. Um, it requires the body to be asleep. And then you have your consciousness staying awake and then spin up out of your body. And I do that too, but that's much more difficult. Uh, remote viewing by using the etheric body is super easy to do. Hmm. Yeah. Are you able to interact uh, with when you remote view? Um, are you able to interact or is it like looking at a painting basically? Can you in interact with your environment is what I'm trying to say. I can interact with my environment. I can feel things. I can touch a leaf or whatever. <clears throat> I can hear voices and watch people, but people don't see me. However, ETs see me and so do spirits. So if I'm, I, I could see, you know, fifth dimensional things coming in and out of our dimension. I will, I will easily see that. And they'll see me. I did, uh, this was funny. I um, remote viewed a case for a lady who wanted to know if she had been abducted by ET. And she had all kinds of evidence that she was, but she wanted confirmation and asked me to remote view it. And, that, and that's the other thing about remote viewing. You can go in the past anytime you want. So you just go to a time and place, not just a place. So I went to the time and place that she said, and I saw her on a craft. I was on the craft, described the inside of it, saw three extraterrestrials over her. She was lying on a steel table, and one of them had his back to me. While I was standing in that room for not more than three seconds, when he turned completely around and looked me in the eye and then stared at me for a minute as if assessing what I was there for and what I could do, and he just turned around and went back to his work. And so I got out of there real quick because then I realized they know I'm there even in the past. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, that just throws all of our ideas about time out the window. Yeah. I mean that, yeah, that's time travel, <laughs> remote viewing, but it's time travel. Yeah. Um, any issues with the grandfather paradox? Do you worry about that if you travel back? No, because I, I don't, I don't time, I don't uh, remote view my family. <laughs> ah. I, except I will say this: I did remote view. Um, I'm a direct descendant of Henry Sinclair, the chief of the what do they call it, uh, the Knights Templar in Scotland. Right. And I knew that uh, they built Roslyn Chapel. And of course, all the mysteries around that. And I just wondered about it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I did remote view when it was being, the foundations were being put in. And I saw uh, Henry Sinclair's son ride up on a big horse, very fancy clothes. And there was some type of an engineer there who was in charge of the project. And he had papers laid out on a table and they were going over the design of it. And what was really odd is that there were quite a few Knights Templar soldiers in a big, huge circle around the area going way out to keep people out so they could not watch what was happening with the foundations. And I, so I looked and I just kind of floated above it and I saw this secret chamber going off to the right of the building and then opening up into a larger chamber, so like a little hallway and then a larger chamber and that is where i believe they kept their hidden treasure ah, um, from solomon's temple yes yes indeed and then i saw it leave sometime later 
uh, in ships off of Scotland, and they were heading west. To Oak Island, perhaps? Yeah, there and other places. Margie, watch that happen. Amazing. We'll take a quick time out. Margie Kay is with us, remote viewer, UFO researcher, author. Back with more in a moment. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Margie Kay is with us, coming to us from Kansas City. And uh, tell us a little bit about um, On X, the uh, radio podcast on X Media. Um, yeah, I have my own podcast. It's called On X News. I've been doing that for some time. And as well as an entire network called the On X Network. And uh, we have 32 shows on right now they're all paranormal and alternative and uh you know various subjects from ufos to sasquatch to uh, astrology and paranormal what have you and also the unex magazine goes along with that so it's a monthly magazine that's uh, digital for all months except the quarters and then the quarters it's also in print and uh subscribers can get a free digital issue Wow, you yeah. are you are one very very busy person. <laughs> I I am a busy person. Um, so I handle the magazine, um, and then Race Hobbs is our program director. He handles the shows, and then I have an in-house marketing assistant who handles our marketing. And but it's still it's still gotten a little bit crazy because we we grew pretty fast in the last two years. We're coming up on our second year anniversary this month onxmedia.com onxmedia.com the link is in the episode notes this is um i want to talk to you about this is one of the strangest cases i've ever heard of and you dedicated a book uh, about it uh, this house in sonoma county california that appears to be some kind of a um, interdimensional gateway this woman natalie roberts has experienced and seen ufos and ETs and ghosts and even small planets and galaxies. I mean, it, it, it's like she's got a little piece of Skinwalker's Ranch right, right there. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, I, I really believe, and I've remote viewed this on a number of occasions, I believe that there is a wormhole there, uh, a vortex, if you will, on that property. And she and her husband saw it quite accidentally uh would when, when these two balls of light came into their bedroom one day and looked around seeming seemingly looked around and then went out the window she so she went to the window to follow them and they went to a particular tree on her property and she noticed that this tree had lights on it kind of like christmas lights so she got very curious about that and started taking pictures daytime nighttime and then she found out she could get better pictures at nighttime so over a period of years, she's taken thousands and thousands of photographs. 250,000. Uh, at a least. A quarter million. Wow. At least that much. And uh, all digital using about nine or 10 different cameras. And other people have, have been on site and 
also taken pictures. But the thing is, she has a relationship with whatever this phenomena is. She communicates with it and sends a message. Would you show yourself, you know, something like that? And then she takes pictures with somebody else standing next to her taking pictures at the same time. She gets five times as many objects in her photos as the other person does. The other person, uh, let's say, is an investigator because there have been investigators out, including Jacques Vallée, and they will not get as many photos as she does. So I remote viewed it um, one day and I saw these what looked like entire galaxies come down, go shrink down in size and go through to the other side. And I wanted to know what the heck was going on there. So I just backed off from the entire planet and I could see a wormhole going through the planet down through the other side that just happens to be where that is located. And I just knew suddenly that it these galaxies go into a, say, a black hole. They go into it. And nobody knows what's on the other side. Nobody knows what happens to things once they go into black holes. Okay. But somehow I was told or just came to know that these things go in and they come out. They're in another dimension on the other side. Hmm. So it's not just her house. It's the neighbors as well. It's a very, very large area that we're talking about. And recently she and her husband pulled up in the driveway at about dusk and they saw an opening in the sky above their house and a UFO came through the opening and then the opening closed. So here, here is another phenomena uh, where <clears throat> that was the first time they'd seen something like that, but it lends itself to the fact that this is probably a portal or a wormhole, just like Skinwalker. Interesting. And um, you you point out that it's situated um, at 38 degrees latitude. Yeah. Does that have some significance? Well, I, I started noticing 37 degrees in Missouri and then 38 and 39. And, and I also noticed longitude, uh, 94 degrees longitude in, in our state. And then that extended out into Arkansas, where these major hotspots are located. UFO hotspot being Kansas City, 94-39. Uh, Sasquatch and UFO sightings, 39-94, etc. Mm. The Joplin Spook Light, 37-94. So it's, it's my opinion that these are energy, this is an energy grid that follows the ley lines that follow the lines of latitude and longitude and they are ley lines as well but if we go to california there is a major ley line crossing in sonoma county right where natalie lives so we also have latitude longitude and major ley line if you if you look at a grid map of the world on the internet you'll see what i'm talking about uh, there's a lot of strange stuff happening at that site where anything paranormal is happening there and i think that these these major hot spots around the world are centered around these energy centers if you will that allow this phenomena to come in from other dimensions and then retreat of those nearly quarter million photos that, that uh, natalie took uh, you've reprinted or published 80, I think 80 of the best in your book, a uh, hundred, a hundred, excuse mm -hmm. me. Can you, uh, I mean, we, people listening obviously can't see them. Uh, but can you maybe describe some of the, um, what you think are some of the more remarkable photos found in your book, Sonoma County phenomenon? We've chose a hundred of real, uh, of some of the best, of course, there are more that are really good, but there are what look like spirits, faces, foggy apparitions, craft, very distinct craft shapes with uh, lines and lights on them and just, you know, 
can't be anything natural. It has to be something that is mechanical. And then there have also been um, balls of light, super bright, very tiny, very large. Um, it's tube shaped objects that are very, you know, very solid looking, very bright lights. And then what look like stars look like entire galaxies as well. It's one of the craziest things I've ever had to investigate. And uh, I, I'm going out there in person. Jacques Vallée said he will go with me uh, when he's in the States. Right now he's in France. So we're going to work something out. Hopefully in the spring, we'll both get out there together with some equipment. And I've got some nice new equipment that I want to try out. So such as a spectrum analyzer, things like that. I'm looking for 1.6 gigahertz. Natalie and her husband aren't frightened. They're, they, no, they're, they're used to it to now. Huh. It, they've even had these uh, balls of light uh, in their house recently, but they're used to it. They're used to the high strangest. They also have things happen like their uh, water faucets in the bathroom or the outside spigots just come on by themselves. Uh, the neighbors have had that happen as well. And if they hadn't been home, there would have been a flood because of these faucets going on. Um, they've had lights go off and on. So kind of poltergeist-like activity as well. But I've also noticed that that poltergeist-type activity is common when people are UFO contactees. When they have been in contact with extraterrestrials, a lot of people think that that's more paranormal. It's more on the ghostly side. I always try to keep an open mind about that because sometimes it isn't. It's about ET. And why they do that, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if they're doing it purposely or if they're simply, uh, it's a byproduct of whatever their transportation system is uh, or they're coming in and out of dimensions that, you know, uh, glasses fall down and doors fly open, things like that. Um, that's that may have something to do with it. There's a, we need to do a lot more study with that. Margie, we'll take another time out back with more of our conversation on the other side. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my rumble channel, Richard Serrett's strange planet. You can watch complete episodes there, new complete unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So, Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. And we're back with Margie Kay. I want to uh, shift to uh, another topic that you've written about, winged aliens, winged humanoids, some people refer to them as. Um, talk to me about your, your research in this, in this field and the idea that um, these winged uh, things like thunderbirds or, or pterodactyls uh, or the mothman all may have sort of a common denominator. Yeah, I started investigating these winged creatures in about 2011 when people I knew who were, who had had UFO sightings started calling me and saying, hey, I saw this gigantic pterodactyl and, and I know what I saw. And, you know, this would be somebody I knew and somebody credible. Um, and then this one particular individual kept having strange things happen. 
And one of them was he kept seeing a Mothman type creature. And I think he had at least seven sightings before uh, moving away from Kansas City. He's still having them today uh, where he lives now in uh, Branson. But his descriptions were too good. And I've known him too long to think that this could have been a hoax. The He would see the creature at a distance and sometimes within 50 feet and sometimes within 10 feet. One time, I think the most dramatic sighting was over 291 Bridge going over the Missouri River. And this creature at about 1030 at night appeared approached his car as he's driving forward it was coming towards him he slowed the vehicle down it hovered in front of the vehicle and had really uh menacing red eyes stared him down and then flew off to the right and he said it had difficulty it looked like it had difficulty staying afloat that it was flapping its wings and was very uh, laborious and then it it disappeared. He said, I think it lives under the bridge. I think that's its hangout. Well, we know about the past bridge relationship yeah, with Silver Mothman. Bridge. Silver Bridge, yeah. The Silver Bridge, the Ohio Bridge, other sightings around bridges, and also either, uh, you know, right before disasters. It's even been seen, it was seen before the Twin Towers in New York. Uh, so in doing research, I'm I'm finding all this very strange stuff. And no disaster happened, no bridge disaster happened, at least not yet, on over the Missouri River. I just find it very odd that that is where, you know, a, a couple of those sightings were. Yeah, what, so, you, what, what is going on here? I mean, I guess we're going to speculate, but are they some kind of a harbinger, these creatures or i hesitate to say that but i think they are also telepathic i have another woman and this is not in the book because it's this just happened a long time ufo experiencer near here had a mothman appear to her a few weeks ago and stand right in front of her it was interdimensional it was see-through transparent but it was definitely there. She said it stayed with her for a week and then left. And she wanted to know why that happened. So I remote viewed it. I went to the site and she had these really large wind chimes outside. And I heard this tone, this vibration. This creature was attracted to that tone, that frequency. OK, she said right before she saw it the first time, she saw two flashes in the sky and then the creature. So I also have a theory that the flashes that people are seeing are a portal opening. And I think we can actually open portals, portals ourselves and cause the flash. And then that's what attracts ETs, people who do the CE5. I do a similar method myself. I've been doing for years where you send a telepathic thought out that you want to see something and it shows up. Well, she had been meditating and asking, she was working in her garden, but meditating and asking to see something. Well, that message got out there somehow, probably telepathically, and the frequency of those chimes attracted it. And she said, it hasn't been menacing it has not sent a message. It hasn't spoken to her. She's asked it several times. Why are you here? What do you want to tell me? Um, she has not gotten a response yet. And then it left for a couple of weeks. And then it came back again. So here we have a case where there's nothing horrible happening. There's no disaster. And it's just there. And it seems to be interdimensional and communicating telepathically. What about your case, your encounter? My Thunderbird encounter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty wild. Uh, earlier in the day, my daughter works for me. She gave me a call 
just after dusk, in a panic. She said she was walking out to her vehicle and she heard footsteps like chasing her behind her and she heard wings flapping. She did not turn around. She just kept going to her car, got in and locked the door. But then this very strange shape appeared in the back window and then enveloped from the back all the way to the front like wings enveloping the entire car, blacked out all of her windows. She was in a panic. She called her son, who also works for me, and he was inside the office at the time. And he looked outside the window and he saw nothing. <laughs> and then the whole thing just dissolved down. It didn't fly away. Nothing. It just dissolved. She told me about that. That same evening, I went outside to my deck to meditate. And something told me to open my eyes. And I looked out and I'm where I am, there's a railroad cut. And then there's trees and houses on the other side of the railroad cut. So about 150 feet away from where I was, I see this body, some kind of a amorphous shape in the tree with wings outstretched. And I mean, at least 30 feet wide. Mm. I'm trying to figure out what the heck I'm looking at. When I hear a noise to my right in the in the tree that's close to me, I look up and there are three small, like two foot tall, winged creatures with their with their uh, wings bent, closed. They're they're sitting there, but they look more like a pterodactyl type. Their wings had no feathers. Now the one that was far away from me, it looked more like it had feathers, like a thunderbird. Like a raptor, like a giant eagle, or uh, yeah, kind of, except that the front of it, I couldn't tell because of the darkness. I couldn't tell the face or the or the head, just that there was a shape there. The wings, however, were just set up within perfectly in the moonlight that I could see them. Well, I looked at those creatures and then I turned back to look at the the big creature, and it was just gone. There was no sound. There was no wing flapping. It was just gone. And then I turned back again to look at the small ones and they were just gone. So I, my logical conclusion is they were interdimensional creatures and I was able to see them because I'd put myself in an altered state of consciousness by meditating. Uh, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, do you think Bigfoot is also interdimensional? Absolutely, yes, I do. I've had encounters with Bigfoot. I had a very strange thing happen a few years ago. I was helping this paranormal team out with a UFO investigation. They, their son had seen a Bigfoot at this location in Missouri. This paranormal team went out to investigate it, and among them were two policemen. So they knew how to investigate. They've been doing this for years. During this investigation, these balls of light appear in the trees, dance around their cameras, and then they start seeing lights in the sky. And then they're popping on, popping off. And I watched this 45-minute video that they had taken, and, and it was a gigantic mothership in the sky. So we finished that investigation up. Of course, I'm you know, working on it all the time anyway. But one day the thought came to me, I wonder if that Sasquatch was real. So I remote viewed it at that location. And sure enough, I see a male Sasquatch with uh, black hair go up to a gigantic tree and pull some brush aside. And the underside of the tree had been dug out. And he goes down in there. And here is a female Sasquatch in labor. And she has a juvenile, a very small one, standing next to her as well. And he had brought her a leaf with water in it and was giving her a drink. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to disturb this private moment. I'm I'm getting out of there. So fast forward to another year after that, and I saw Kiwani speak. And he wrote a book called The Psychic Sasquatch. Oh, yes, yes. So I had to get that book. And I thought... Okay, he's saying Sasquatch are very intelligent. 
and that they use psychic abilities and can communicate telepathically. I thought, well, I'd like to try that with this fellow that I saw. So I did. And instantly he's standing in front of me. I said, what's your name? He said, call me Dave. Well, I got a good laugh at that because the only thing I could think of was Cheech and Chong. Uh, <laughs> Dave's not here. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I know that's not his real name, but that's what I call him. And we developed a relationship over several years. Then he introduced me to the elder of the clan, brought him to my house. They both appeared transparent in my driveway. The elder spoke to me and he was observing me and seeing if I was okay. And then he said, yes, that I had a sufficient, sufficiently high vibration that they could have communication with me. They introduced me to their entire clan. They introduced me to the female chief, also shaman of the clan. She has worked on me several times and done healing work that has been amazing. She's, uh, she's fixed me overnight. And, you know, if I had a major problem or bad pain the next morning, it's gone. So they communicate, they are friendly. They tell me they are more intelligent than union humans, that they use more of their brains than we do They They are interdimensional and we're never going to get capture one or get a body because when humans are around, they phase out into fifth dimension and they're still standing there looking at you, but you can't see them. And they also told me a secret. They build the structures, you know, with the bending the tree limbs over or making arches. Those are for the juvenile Bigfoot to phase out to go into another dimension. The older ones can do it without that, but the younger ones can't. And so they have to walk into an arch to get out of third dimension to go to a higher dimension. Wow. Remarkable. Remarkable. What's, um, I mean, what does this say about our planet and our world and who we are and all of the rest? What does it, what does it all mean? Well, I think it says we've just scratched the surface. We don't know what reality is. You know, science, science doesn't have the answers unless they're willing to go beyond standard nuts and bolts science. They've got to go into consciousness. That's the key to everything. Margie, yeah. we've just scratched the, uh, the surface, but um, it's been a delight and I hope we can do it again soon. Well, thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate it. Margie K. And again, the website, unxmedia.com. Richard Serrett's A Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is... I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.